Sasha Baron Cohen was the pioneer of trolling, and here we see Paris Hilton trolling with her shirt, Stop Being Poor. Well, what's quite funny about that, aside from the fact that she's probably in an expensive club and she's wearing this shirt, is that she didn't actually wear this shirt, so some troll out there uh, photoshopped this. You can actually see the Photoshop job there in this um, meme picture that became quite famous, and I don't know, it said stop being fabulous or something before, and he made it say stop being poor, and that's probably even funnier than her wearing this shirt because then everybody became upset. So I'm sure Miss Hilton has made her fair share of bad decisions in life, but today we're going to talk about bad decisions I've made in my investing life. So those include looking for the next Microsoft, dabbling in over-the-counter stocks, thinking that stock price has anything to do with a stock being cheap, thinking I was going to be some big, big swinging dick trader, uh, being Warren Buffett, thinking that diversification is for pussies, finding a guru, guru out there to absolve me of all my bad decisions, investing in stories, uh, companies that don't have revenues, and lastly, investing in stocks, not companies. We're going to talk about all of these today. So let's start by looking at the three components of wealth creation. These are the money that you make, the money you save, and the money you earn from those savings. Now, I love this statement, being poor is expensive, and we're going to talk about why that is. And of course, you've heard this, you need money to make money. So in order to make money and maximize your income, I had put down study STEM, and I often say that it worked for me. But I think what you really need to do, because I've met a lot of wealthy people that didn't study STEM, is you need to be a PhD, and a PhD that stands for poor, hungry, and determined. That's the most important thing. You also need to live below your means so you can save more. There's plenty of content out there on how you can do this. We always say drive a used Toyota that makes a lot of financial sense. Early on, as an investor, you need to be very careful, and this goes to the old saying, always fear someone who has nothing to lose. And when you have nothing to lose, you're going to lose it fairly fast. So how you'll start out is pretty much how the vast majority of all investors start out. It's with a very small bankroll. Now, the immediate temptation is to go big or go home. Again, you have very little to lose. At this time, what you're going to do is you're going to start looking for shortcuts. And then you're going to start noticing all the tool bags out there who are trying to sell you stuff. So the classic hedge funds hate us for this one simple trick, people. Uh, learn how to be a day trader with my $250 course. Uh, some report on 100 bagger stocks. They always talk in terms of baggers. Anything related to binary options and crypto. Uh, I like this chart here that shows just how bad an idea binary options are. They're just pure scams. Finding the next Microsoft. So thinking it's just a matter of finding that one stock that's going to move you to a different zip code. What's going to happen is that you're inevitably, it doesn't matter how many warnings you receive, you're going to step on some of these landmines and you're going to learn the hard way. Get that out of the way as quick as possible. Then, as a newbie, eventually you're going to open a brokerage account at some point and start proper investing. Now, be careful. So um, we did a piece on uh, this topic of binary options and it looked at the Ramat Gan district in Israel, and it's remarkable. There's somewhere around five to 10,000 companies there that are trying to fleece people, and they all use call centers and lead lists. And it's covered in this report by uh, Nat Geo called Trafficked. It's always around some exciting trading opportunity. Uh, they'll show you plenty of paper gains, and the amount of scams is incredible. But here's a golden rule. Never, never Put money in an account with an institution unless it's found on this next page. All right, so what you see circled here in red, these are all legitimate brokerage firms. We use the two highlighted in yellow. Now, the ones there with a the question mark, I'm not so, so sure about those because I haven't used them or done the research there. They seem to be reputable, but you always need to do your own due diligence. As for Robinhood, they have, and we've covered this in multiple videos, a a track record, and they've been penalized by the SEC for it, of promoting irresponsible investing. So we want nothing to do with people like that. Now, after you've opened your brokerage account, you need to be very careful about the JT Marlins of the world. If you haven't seen this movie called Boiler Room, you ought to watch it. It's really good, and it teaches you something. What it teaches you is that there are a lot of boiler rooms, what they call them out there, promoting penny stocks. And in the day of social media, 
our era of being able to have um, countless accounts out there uh, pushing something down people's throats. You need to set some rules that that prevents you from falling into any of these traps. Now, let's talk about penny stocks, all right? Now, you might assume that a penny stock is any stock that trades for less than a dollar, and you wouldn't be wrong, right? That's the traditional definition. But what happens here, or the way that we define it, is that when a stock trades below a dollar a share, it moves from a major exchange, if it was ever on one, to the over-the-counter exchange. So you need to be aware of that. Because when a stock price gets that low, there's typically systemic problems with the company. So the rule here is this. Any stocks that trade on over-the-counter exchanges, regardless of the price, you need to avoid like the plague. Now, you may say, well, how do I identify those? Well, the easiest way then is to simply say, listen, stick with stocks on NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange, major exchanges. You still won't be entirely safe, but that's a good rule to have. Now, People often bring up ping sheets. These are uh, what they call ADRs, stocks that trade on the ping sheet exchange because they actually trade on foreign exchanges. Now, until you're a sophisticated investor, you do not dabble at all in any of that stuff. You say, well, how do I know I'm a sophisticated investor? Here's a test. When intuitively you can see why a $10 stock is not cheaper than a $100 stock. When that becomes intuitive in your mind, then you're starting to get there in terms of your sophistication as an investor. And what you eventually start doing is seeing stock prices that are quite low as suspicious instead of seeing them as cheap. The way that you can avoid any of these problems, another way, so we've said don't trade OTC, Make sure that you understand why a $10 stock is not cheaper than a $100 stock. It has to be intuitive. Set a market cap cutoff. Here at Nanalyze, our cutoff is a billion dollars. So we don't invest in companies less than a billion dollars. Now, I put this here. It's, uh, we have this in our methodology, which you can find in the About Us section of our website, which details um, how we invest in disruptive tech companies. And we've listed these red flags for penny stocks. I've crossed out the word penny because these warning flags are something you should pay attention to for any stock. Um, founded through the reverse merger of a shell. Those are SPACs. And 99% of SPACs have uh, done investors no favors, as we warned everyone when they first debuted. Um, there will, for a lot of these companies, almost never be revenues that help demonstrate traction. If there are no revenues and you want to see substantial, we define that as $10 million per annum or more. If there's not substantial revenues, you walk away, you're not interested. What will happen oftentimes is constructive criticisms of these stocks will be met with accusations of short selling. That in itself is a red flag. Remember, we talked about boiler rooms. Those people come around and say, how dare you say something negative about our sacred cow? What you'll also see for companies that don't have revenues or they're struggling to get revenues are these agreements, these constant agreements being put out in press releases that never actually go anywhere. What you can then do is look back and see all these previously made promises that were consistently broken. What almost always ends up happening, and these things can hold people on for a very long time, is that long-term investors are left holding shares that are worthless, called bag holders. So, we talked about how being poor is expensive. I think the classic example of that would be payday loans, short-term, high-interest loans available to people that are living paycheck to paycheck. The smaller the bankroll you're playing with, the easier it is for somebody to take that away from you. That's because you're always looking for the quick way to wealth because it seems so far away. So unless you have a plan, you're going to be led astray. There are no shortcuts to getting wealthy. There is no free lunch. What you will sometimes think is that you might be able to trade your way to success. We see this all the time. So let's talk about my life as a trader. That started decades ago, so 21 years ago, when I discovered nanotechnology. I think I was so excited when I read Drexler's paper that I opened up a, a brokerage account that same day and I literally invested in a stock that same day. And then what I found myself doing was buying and selling stocks multiple times in a single day. I had no conviction. Then I moved on to automated Forex trading strategies and I was going to become some algo trader. And then what I did is I went to B school. I read all the recommended reads out there. I went down to Canary Wharf. You see in this picture, I knocked on doors. I met with real IB prop traders. I sat on trading floors. I saw trading. What I ended up getting was a position at Morgan Stanley right before they spun off their risk management firm or one of their divisions into what is now known as MSCI. So 
I started a career in risk management in the summer of 2007, and I started accumulating wealth just as soon as I stopped trading and started investing. You might say, well, tra trading and investing are the same thing. Well, it comes down to duration. We did this piece, Swing Trading Suckers. It's quite good. I'll put a link to it at the end of this presentation. Day trading involves jumping in and out the same day, swing trading days or weeks, trend trading weeks or months. So what's the difference between trading and investing? The difference is this. You invest in companies, you trade stocks. So even if you're investing in companies, the odds are still against you, and that's why you need to manage risk. So my pedigree, I have an MBA with a finance focus. I have an additional master's in finance and portfolio management with a focus on risk management. I spent a decade working at one of the most premier providers of investment products uh, in, on this planet, including some of the most sophisticated risk solutions that you can buy. That's the bad news. The good news is I've been investing for decades and I've made every mistake in the book as we're talking about today. When you start accumulating some proper money in life, you're going to realize a number of things. One, making money is really tough and you sacrifice a lot. And the harder you work, the luckier you get. Not losing the money that you've generated becomes pretty important because you realize how tough it is to get. But people will say, Munger said diversification is your biggest enemy. Well, you're not Munger, and neither are 99.999% of the people on this planet. So in order to preserve all that wealth that you've managed to accumulate, you need to be diversified. That's very important. And this is our SWAN strategy. SWAN stands for sleep well at night. Three basic components of anybody's investment strategy ought to include safe assets, riskier assets, and alternative assets. Now, safe, right? That's there's always going to be risk associated with investing. But uh, what you can then do is start to look at your allocations in terms of asset classes and the extent to which each is exposed to risk. Here you can see our asset, asset class allocation from December of 2022. And I didn't bother updating this because, to be honest, if I pulled this chart up, it wouldn't have changed much. That's because we're so well diversified that our assets are fairly well protected depending on whatever the market is doing. So you need to take that approach when you're investing. The other thing you need to do is be very careful about who you listen to. So a lot of people now are going to social media to learn about investing. Well, you need to ask some questions. Is the person speaking interested in helping me become a better investor? So most of the people out there, they, they actively cram some sacred cow down your throat, and they're not regularly promoting investing best practices. Ask this, do they come to the table with experience? Now, that can be industry or academic or both. What that helps them do is provide you with something more than just parroting superficial mainstream wisdom from industry greats like Buffett. Now, everyone's a financial guru out there, um, and anybody can suddenly say they are. Just because you have money doesn't mean you know how to manage it. So you need to put in the time. And the other question here, you know, do these individuals have enough life experience to add value to both young and old? So be very wary of the 25-year-old life coach out there. And are they selling something? The answer is yes, everyone is. There's no free lunch. But the quality of what they're selling is going to be reflected on these questions that we just asked. And you can see here how some individuals out there, won't name names, have uh, promoted uh, some very dubious things that don't benefit investors just to enrich, to pad their own portfolios that they get, then, then go and show everybody to talk about all the wealth that they've accumulated. And people eat that up. So Social media platforms are where Gen Zers or what they use to learn about personal finance. That would be people 27 years or younger. And we have a lot of those coming around. Our own YouTube channel, which we started relatively recently, even though we've been doing this research now for decades, uh, you can see here that YouTube is the second most popular place at 27%. TikTok, surprisingly, at 42%. So what they're looking for on these channels, the first, the most thing that everyone's looking for. The biggest thing would be saving and budgeting. Well, do you know who David Goggins is? And you know what I mean when I say you got to Goggins that shit, all right? Nobody's going to tell you how to, how to exercise some discipline. You're going to have to do that yourself. 
passive income, there's no easy way out, okay? DGI, dividend growth investing, our strategy, Quantigens, is a great strategy, and we use that ourselves. It's what most of our money is in. It provides great passive income. Investing in the stock market, 60% of them look for that. Well, few channels out there, honestly, teach you how to be a better investor. Retirement planning, they'll look for that. Again, more Goggins shit, discipline. Debt, you don't ever hold it. And mortgages are the exception. Investing in crypto, no, absolutely no, period. Uh, investing in real estate, you've got REITs. Uh, you see our you know, comment on mortgages being the exception there. Investing in other assets, yeah, there's some quality alternatives that can be fun. Uh, we invest in wine and art, for example. So the importance of a financial education, the easier it is to make money, the quicker you're going to lose it. It's hard to make money. Gambling's a great example of that phenomenon. Lottery winners are more likely to declare bankruptcy when, within three to five years than the average American. So if you happen to come across money and you're looking for ways to invest it, also be very careful. If you suddenly start out with a larger bankroll, half, let's say roughly half of all money inherited is saved and the other half spent or lost investing. That's why you have this saying, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. It describes the inability of grandchildren to manage well. So just to conclude, the two most important rules in investing are don't lose money and see rule number one. The reality is that there are going to be losers. You will lose some money if you choose to dabble in stocks. If you choose to invest in safer assets, as we described, that's a different story. The solution here, the answer is be aware of your risk and actively manage and manage that risk. That's what we do here at Nanalyze. We teach people how to stop being poor. So I'm going to put up another presentation here that's really good. It's on swing trading for suckers. If you want to be a big swinging dick trader, you're going to want to watch this. So uh, please make sure to like this video. Share it with other people who think who you think can benefit from this. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.